my relationship with my mother, maybe your relationship with your mother, is one of the most impactful relationships that probably you have, for better or for worse. And so we want to just acknowledge the moms in the room today. I know the sacrifice, the blood, sweat, and tears, um, the patience that you have endured, the strength that you've endured, um, and we just want to honor you today. So if you're a mom in the room, can we just give moms an applause? My favorite coffee mug says, home is where your mom is, and that's true. Um, and uh, I also want to acknowledge today, though, that though we celebrate moms, we have succulents for moms, hopefully you got brunch or a card or made flowers or something or grew, uh, gave flowers. Um, I, I also know that this is a heavy day um, for some of you. Um, maybe you lost your mother this year or this past year. Maybe you have longed to be a mother um, and this day on the calendar comes up every year and you're like, not again. You know, you're reminded of a loss or a grief. We grieve with you again today. That relationship, the relationship of motherhood is um, powerful, can be challenging, can be um, full, full of strength and encouragement. Um, we just have to acknowledge that power of that relationship. We've been in a series called uh, How We Relate, where we're looking at different relationships and we're looking at the power of relationships and the reality that we are living in a fractured time and space where there is, um, it's difficult. It's difficult to have healthy relationships in an often disconnected and divided and broken world. I don't know, uh, two weeks ago we started this series, and I think the government was listening to us. Did you see the headlines that came out on that Monday? I had a couple of you text me, like um, Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, came out on the Monday following um, the first sermon of this series talking about the epidemic of loneliness again. Came out with an 85-page report of the, um, the loneliness epidemic in America an 85-page report on how we are struggling to, to healthily, socially interact. And he urges that we have to grow as a culture um, in connection. We have to grow as a culture in our relatedness and how we relate to one another. And he says this, we have to cultivate values of kindness, respect, service, and commitment to one another. And then he like writes 85 more pages. <laughs> Cultivate values of kindness, respect, service, and commitment to one another. We must end loneliness. We must end this fractured condition in our relationships. But how do we do this? Well, we have to cultivate these values. Where do these values come from? And we have to commit to one another. You have to. We have to commit to connection, to making relationships a priority over in entertainment, over our career aspirations, over individualism? Have you felt like the individual is like, uh, is so idolized today? What you individually care about and who you're individually becoming is idolized even often over the collective, over the community. And yet we're seeing in government systems, in culture, Everybody's grappling for how do I make friends? How do I have healthy relationships? How do I have all this connection? How do I have a healthy connection? So for the past few weeks, we've been talking about the reality that God, one, made us for relationship. Um, we're in a world, too, that is kind of divided and disconnected, and we relate best by growing healthy relationships. For the first week, we talked about uh, being available, um, being available, showing up, slowing down to listen, eye contact. Um, I got to get away this past weekend uh, with my bride, um, with Jenna. We were um, uh, in a hotel at the pool, and one night I was like reading a book, and she said, I, I love it when you just ask me questions. I was like, yeah, I, I ask you questions a lot. She's like, no, but like, I, we're here, and you're asking me questions, and you're listening to me. I'm like, so score one for me. I was available on vacation. Um, <laughs> It's easy to be available on vacation, isn't it? It's really hard to be available with our attention, our eye contact, undistracted when the anxiety comes, when the pressures hit, when you got to get your kids to um, every different place, and when you've got all these different pressures and pulls around you. How have you been doing at being available? Um, last week, Tim Coburn 
uh, was down from Sacramento and he talked about the power of vulnerability. And he looked at Jesus as our model of like how we're invited to, to live a vulnerable life where we, are, where we present our weaknesses, where we risk, where we step out of ourselves, how vulnerability can impact our faith and our connection with God and with others. And today, I want to talk about a term that you're probably going to squirm when we put it on the, uh, on the screen. I want to talk about accountability. Anybody can leave now. Um, because it's Mother's Day and my mother was often the one in my life who held me accountable when I was rude, when I was irritable, uh, when I punched my little brother, when I was irrational, um, we're going to talk about accountability. But really, accountability, um, accountability impacts our heart impacts our faith, impacts our life with God, our relationships in an incredible way if we can work accountability, healthy accountability into our relationships, into our, th- into our faith. What do you think of when you hear that term though, accountability? What comes to mind when you hear accountability? I remember walking into a store with my mom when I was really little. I probably told this story once before. I apologize if you've heard it. We walked into the store. I believe it was Kmart. I think those are dead now, right? And we walked into a Kmart and, um, and we passed by the toy section. I see a toy that my heart desired and I just had to, had to, had to have it. And my mom said no. And I lost my mind in the middle of the Kmart. Um, and, uh, and she said, well, no means no, and so no. And my mom turned to leave the aisle, and as she turned to look away, I had a decision to make. Do I take the toy anyway? And so I took the toy, and I stuffed it in my coat, and we walked through Kmart, and she checked out, and I climbed into our Dodge, old Dodge minivan with like that, that wood stain, like, you know that wood stain line on those old Dodge minivans? And, and I got in the back seat, and she heard the crinkling of plastic. Now, I don't fully remember this story. This is the story my mother tells, but I remember what happened next. Because she she said, what is that? And I said, it's He-Man. Right, He-Man, sorry, age myself. And I pull out this toy, and she grabs me by the collar, and she drags me back into Kmart. And she finds, they had like a mall cop or some kind of authority figure. And I stood before this big towering man and cried and sobbed. And my mom held me accountable that day. And I have to admit, I have never shoplifted another day (laughs) in my life. What do you think of when you think of accountability? I was thankful for that level of accountability. To be accountable, to be accountable is to be a person, an organization, or institution that is required or expected to justify their actions or decisions. To be brought forward and to say, justify, show yourself. To be held responsible for. To be able to give an account. To be able to put out there, here's what I have in my jacket pocket. Here's what I have done. Today I want to talk about two forms of accountability that we see in scripture. And we're going to have as much fun with this as we possibly can. So please, you know, giggle and laugh and be uncomfortable with me. Okay, so number one, number one, two, two, uh, you said giggle, that was weird. I want to talk about, I want to talk about two forms of accountability that we see in scripture, and the first is this. Number one, we will give an account and are accountable to God. (laughs) We will give an account and are accountable to God. We are all responsible to God. And number two, God gives us healthy accountability with one another to grow us. We will all give an account to God and God gives us healthy accountability with one another to grow us. The first, we see this truth, this idea of accountability clearly all throughout scripture. God is not apathetic to what you do. God is not indifferent to how you behave. God is not agnostic to the life that you live. God deeply cares about how you live, about the decisions that you make, and will judge, will weigh, 
will take an account of our lives and how we treated other people, how we served or we didn't serve, if we fed the poor or if we just fed ourselves, if we cared for others or if we were just wrapped up in the individual or the self, how we handled our business on earth, we will give an account to God. In the Old Testament scriptures, we see this a lot. Like the prophet Nathan comes to David. Remember David and Goliath, he had the stones and he killed him. And he, like everybody chants and he's anointed king. And he finally becomes king and he's an incredible king. But then he gets bored. He gets bored. He sends his armies out to pillage, nation building, empire building. He stays back and he gets bored. And he says, oh, there's this beautiful woman. And he inquires of her. And then he commits adultery. And then to hide that adultery, he commits another offense. He puts her husband on the front lines to have him killed. And then finally, when Nathan the prophet comes to David, there's this moment of accountability. 2 Samuel 12 verse 9 says this, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? He holds him to an account. You despised the word of the Lord and you did what was evil in his eyes. We see this in Moses. When Moses gets angry and actually has this moment of disobedience, Moses has led a nation through the desert for 40 years but doesn't get to cross the river into the promised land because he has been held accountable for his disobedience. We see it in Saul. We see it in Abraham and so on. Jesus even says, when we turn the page into the New Testament, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says this, I tell you, Jesus says a lot of incredible things, a lot of nice things, but he says, I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. Mm. Everyone will have to bring forward what they have been responsible for and the empty words, the lies, the broken promises that they have spoken. Not just David and Moses, but we all will show an account. We are all accountable to God, good or bad. The writer of Hebrews says explicitly, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of God to whom we must give an account. Paul writes in Romans chapter 14, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Happy Mother's Day. (laughs) We are all accountable to God. We're all accountable. We all will be responsible to God. Does that feel intimidating, exposing? Yeah. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Uh, I remember multiple instances of the story I'm about to tell you um, where we will, Jenna and I will discover something that one of our children has done, all right? It wasn't Keegan this time, it was another one. Um, And, you know, we'll... Uh, we'll pull one of our children in front of us and we'll sit them down in front of us and it's mom and it's dad and it's them and they're in the room and we know what they've done but we we will tease it out we'll say hey do you know where such and such went you know usually it's candy in the upper you know like do you know where all the chocolate went and no I I have no idea And, and you start to see this like shifting of the eyes and their face gets flush and there's tears in their eyes and there's this and it's hor it's horrible as a parent there's a part of me that I maybe I'm I don't know I went through it so it's like it's it's a it's a passage where you go but I'm watching this happen and I'm going oh I just want you to say I did it And then finally, they break, right? They crack. And there's floodgates and there's tears. And it's horrible to watch as a parent. But all we want them to do is to say, this is what I said. This is what I did. The candy is hidden under my pillow, whatever, so that we can then come and restore them and make it right. See, I think God gives us the parental relationship, healthy parental relationships, to show us a little bit about his heart. Because when we find our kids in a mistake, we're not trying to crush them. We're not trying to abuse them, destroy them. We're trying to restore them. We're trying to put them back together. We're trying to show them the error of their ways 
And there's that fear that my kids feel, right, of like being found out or getting in trouble or getting grounded or whatever, right? But, but God gives us his picture. I love that. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of God is understanding. The fact that you and I will give an account to God can be intimidating at first glance. But, the rea- but when we come to grips with the fact that everything is already laid bare, there are no secrets, so why should I try and hide them? There is nothing that I have done, will do, can do that God will never find out. It's all right there in front of him. There is a wisdom that comes. There's a knowledge that comes. There's this clarity that comes. And ultimately, there's a confidence that comes. God is not after taking account of us so that you and I will continue to walk in shame. But he wants to free us of our shame. He wants to free us of our guilt. That's why Jesus stepped onto the planet, became flesh, walked into the muck with us, walked among us, took on everything on himself on the cross so that you and I, though we will give an account to God for everything, will stand before God knowing in Christ he's settled our debts. He's canceled our accounts. We can have confidence to approach him. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Let us approach God with confidence so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God sees everything. We are accountable to God. We are responsible to God. He sees it all and he invites us to, to look to Jesus. We will give an account to God who is to be revered and who is gracious to us in Jesus. And number two, Another part of um, accountability. God gives us healthy accountability with one another to grow us. God gives us healthy accountability with one another in relationship to grow us. Um, I love reading Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen writes books like The Wounded Healer that just talks about the suffering way of Jesus and how he walks with us in it. He talks a lot about spiritual direction and formation. He has this powerful line. He says, the goal of spiritual direction and formation is the ever-increasing capacity to live a spiritual life from the heart with God. A spiritual life cannot be fully formed without discipline, practice, and accountability. He says a growing life with God, a growing, flourishing life with God cannot take place without discipline, practice, and accountability. You can receive his grace. His grace is free. His mercy is free. But you cannot have this flourishing life with God without accountability, without this accountability with one another. See, we have one another to share our accounts with. We have one another to share our stuff with. Have you ever experienced a lack of accountability? Maybe in the workplace or in the home or in some relationship where you like went to work and your boss was aloof and there were no set standards, no set goals, there were no reviews or check-ins and you're working maybe in a set of cubicles and you're like, man, she's over there doing God knows what and he's over there. He's like golfing during the day. Nobody's, ta- it's, it's total chaos. A lack of ability breeds uh, laziness, breeds stagnancy, breeds frustration between different people. A lack of accountability in the home breeds chaos, right? There's no set rules. There's no set standards. There's no set, and we've seen this. We've seen a lack of accountability on display, whether it be government institutions, organizations, politicians, pastors, lack of accountability, to parenting styles, a lack of accountability breeds chaos. And bad accountability, bad accountability is top-down accountability. That's like, I'm going to hold you to a standard that I won't hold myself. Have you ever had a boss like that? I remember my dad used to say to me often, Brent, do as I say, not as I do. Bad accountability. Because you're modeling something different. Don't be angry, but I'm going to scream at you. Bad accountability where somebody uses the truth to abuse, harm, destroy someone. 
Some of you maybe have had relationships in your life marked with bad, manipulative accountability. And it just breeds shame. I had a friend after the last service say, um, the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I did something wrong. Shame is, I am something wrong. And bad accountability can lead to the belief that you are the something that is wrong. Have you experienced a lack of accountability? Have you experienced bad accountability? See, true and real, mutual, compassionate accountability is different. It brings healing into your relationships. It builds healthy and strong individuals and relationships and a growing life with God and with one another regardless of the relationship, your marriage, your roommates, your best friends, your kids, your parents. There is this mutual accountability. Hello. It's okay. <laughs> but uh <laughs> It breeds health. Hey. And so how do we do this? How do we do this? I kind of like that. I can see your faces. How do, we, how do we do this? We need it. How do we do good accountability, healthy accountability? Number one, we're just going to walk through this together. Number one, accountable relationships are marked by confession. So really quickly before we go any further, I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to confess um, the worst thing you did this week. On, the, on your mark, get set. Go, I'm totally joking, all right? <laughs> Confession, you're like, I don't know the person. And I do know the person. Confessing something, confessing anything is really intimidating. Confessing our worst behaviors is not easy. And we see it, like, right, I see it in my kids. It was me. I didn't want to confess that I, had this, that, I, that I had this thing. And so we shift, we hide. It is so much easier to conceal rather than confess. The great psychologist Carl Jung said this, for we are all in some way or another kept asunder, love that word, by our secrets. And instead of seeking through confession to bridge the abysses that separate us from another, we choose the easy byway of deceptive opinions and illusions. He said, for we all are in the same boat. Confession is actually a bridge to connection, but we often choose just to live, to project, to hide underneath these deceptions and illusions. Confession is not the easy road, but it is a bridge to connection. I've told the story maybe once or twice before, I apologize, about a time that I was newly married. Jen and I will have been married 19 years in August, and I'm stoked on it. But we, um, we went to um, one of those value-centered uh, furniture places when we were fresh out of college, and we bought a brand new couch. I don't know why we buy white couches all the time, but we had a white couch. We bought a white couch, and we brought it back. It was Jenna's white couch, and I got back from church on a Sunday had a red drink in my hand. Don't ask me why I was drinking Kool-Aid as a grown man, but I'm drinking this Kool-Aid. I spill the Kool-Aid on the cushion. Jenna isn't there. And again, I'm back in Kmart. I have a decision to make. <laughs> do I tell her or do I flip the cushion? And I flip the cushion. I flip the cushion. Confessing it. And so... And she comes home, and I, I have, like, a nervous energy about me in general, but I was really jittery. And she's like, how is church? This is good. It's like, how's the game going? Good. And I'm like, where do you want to go eat? I had to get out of the house. I had to get away from the cushion. And then I went to bed that night, and I'm laying in bed, and I'm just tossing and turning. I'm breathing heavy. And she's like, are you sick? I'm like, no, I'm not sick. Are you okay? And I'm like, fine. I did it. <laughs> she's like, did What? She's thinking, worst case scenario, and I said, I ruined your couch, and I walked her downstairs. See, confession, I, I, I dealt with it, right? I had some consequences, but confession was the bridge to connection. Concealing just drove this wedge between us. Confession is all throughout the scriptures. The psalmist writes about confessing to God. Psalm 32 says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. I was tossing and turning. My strength was sapped in the heat of the summer. 
Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I didn't cover my iniquity from you. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And what does it say that God does? And you smite me. You judged me. No. It says you and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Confession has this healing effect. Confession is the bridge to connection with God and to one another. That's why James writes in James chapter 5, Therefore, I tell you, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. There is healing in confession. Does confession mark your faith? Does confession mark your relationships? Number two, we got confession, and then accountable relationships are marked by correction. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you a hard truth. This is what correction is. If anybody sat down across the table from you and says, I need to say something hard to you. I need to correct something in you. Now, I struggled with this word choice. I actually let uh, every, I love like writing messages and talk, and I love bringing other people's voices into it. So our team gets to like make edits and comments and different things. And I got a comment that was like, maybe you should change this word. This is a little strong. Maybe it should be encouragement, or maybe it should be feedback, right? And I appreciate that. Like, I love to have feedback circles, but I choose correction because we don't like to be corrected. But all, again, all throughout Scripture, we see the power of correction, of being a rebukable person, to being a person that is okay with being corrected. I don't know if you have had a friend like this who just tells you the truth. Just tell me like it is. No fluff, no flattery. Just tell me the truth. What do you see? Where am I going wrong? Someone who's willing to call you on something in love, not from a place of harm or abuse. It is important to have friendships, to have relationships that have correction a part of them. And to be a person who invites correction. Proverbs 24, 26 says this. An honest answer is a sign of true friendship. An honest answer is a sign of true friendship. Proverbs 27 verse 6 says, Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. But man, we love flattery. We love to hear what's great about ourselves. One of my love languages is affirmation, words of affirmation. I love to hear words of affirmation. I tend to shy. I like, eh, I, I, I don't like correction. I don't like wounds from a sincere friend. Things that actually cut me a little bit but are necessary. But truth, rebuke, correction is so needed today. So needed today. And it's so important for you and I to find people in our life who speak truth to us in love. We can't go to Instagram, we can't go to Twitter, we can't go to any of that stuff for correction. People are just ushering, like waiting to correct everybody else, but are not correctable themselves. Luke chapter 17 says this, Jesus says, be alert. If you see your friend going wrong, correct him. If he responds, forgive him. That's simple. The, the Gospels record Jesus saying, truly I tell you, over 56 times, Jesus told hard truths that people, to people that needed to hear it. He did it in love. This loving, humble correction marked Jesus' relationships, and it should ours as well. So accountable relationships are marked by confession. That's tough. Accountable relationships are marked by correction. How correctable are you? And number three, accountable relationships are marked by ownership. By ownership. This sense of I take responsibility. And I know you know this, but we're in a time in society, and I'm going to say this as gently as I can, we're taking ownership and responsibility for our own stuff is a lost art. We've done so much deep work as a culture. We've done so much introspection. I've done genograms and family trees and lineages and seen how addiction and different things and different behaviors have mapped those in, in my past. That it's really easy as a culture to do something, say something, act a certain way, treat someone a certain way, and they go, oh, 
well, my, my dad was like that, and he did that, and so now I can do. It's kind of this blame shifting. It's taking, like, half ownership. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like I see this in how we blame our parents, how we blame the government, how we blame some other institution or education. We blame the church. We often lack the ability to just own our own mistakes. Say, yeah, that was me. I did that. Did you know that God, or the the prophet Nathan said um, that David was a man after God's own heart. Now, David committed adultery. He put Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, on the front line so that he would be killed. How is he still called a person who is modeled after God's own heart? I think it's because repentance, like this responsibility, marked him. Uh, Nathan comes to David and he puts out his account in front of him, his adultery, his lies. And David simply responded in 2 Samuel chapter 12. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's it. He says, I did it. I'm not blaming my boredom. I'm not blaming the previous King Saul who tried to kill me his whole life. I'm not blaming how I was overlooked by all my siblings and my father forgot that I was in the field when they came to look for me. I'm not, for, I, I, I'm not blaming that I was mocked. Throughout. He says, I did it. I have sinned. I love reading Psalm 51. If you have been caught in guilt or shame, a mistake, if you have fallen prey as David and many others did throughout scripture, Psalm 51 is a beautiful prayer that I would encourage you to read. But Psalm 51 verse 3 says this. He just simply writes, I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And then he goes on and he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore me to the joy of my my salvation. And I will teach others the error of my ways. I'll teach others how to be restored. See, radical ownership is needed today. Radical responsibility. I know for me, when I hurt someone, when I make a sarcastic joke that is not funny, when I am sharp, I'll tend to justify and go like, well, I just want you to know my motive. I didn't mean it. And, and if you could just know that like my, my goal in this was not poor. Man, but I just need to own it. Just say, no, I did that. I own that. I am responsible for my mistakes. I am responsible for my own growth. I'm not blaming someone else, some other institution, some other person, place, or thing for my own growth. I've got to take responsibility. And I think as a church, what if radical ownership marked us? Last, accountable relationships are marked by trust. All of these things are great. Confession is great. Correction is great. Radical ownership is great. But if you do not have relationships built on the backbone of trust, who are you going to confess to? Who are you going to invite to correct you? You don't just show up to a random person and say, correct me. Right? You don't show up to somebody who you don't trust and say, I invite this voice. Like, trust takes time. Trust takes a history. Trust takes a history of showing up, of slowing down, of being available, of vulnerability. What relationships do you have in your life that you just trust? Last 10% of truth, bottom of the barrel, trust. To speak into your life, to call you out, to call you up, to speak what's true. Who do you have? What relationships do you need to invest in so that trust can be built, so that accountability can be worked into them? I know in every season of my life, in my faith, in my marriage, in every season of the church, I have needed to seek out, I have to seek out relationships of trust. Relationships where I can sit across the table with somebody and say, man, here's what's going on. God's delivered a few of those here in our church who are at Lucy's. And I have a friend who just says, tell me, what, what's up? And I'll say, here's where I'm tired. Here's where I'm weak. Here's where I'm really frustrated. Here's where I've failed. Here's what I think about myself. And I'll find loving, humble correction. Sometimes it's correction of you are not your failures. You are a much-loved son of God. I'll find a correction of a lie I might be believing about myself or my circumstances in an accountable 
relationship? Do you have that person, those people, that kind of a marriage where you can sit in the room and close the door and keep the kids out for as long as you possibly can and say, where are you weak? Where have you failed? Where are you, how can I, how can we strengthen each other? A couple questions to wrap up. Number one, do you confess to others and are you a safe person to confess to? Do you seek to correct others more than you are correctable? Just some questions to take a gauge throughout your week. Do you use accountability to shame others or restore them? Do you believe that you're restoring them, but you're actually shaming them? You might want to ask them. Do you take ownership, responsibility for your growth, relational and spiritual? And what time do you need to give to someone else to develop that level of trust? Um, I really, uh, I want to end just by saying, um, just by saying this again. We will all give an account to God and God gives us one another to be accountable with one another so that we can look more like Jesus. In Jesus Christ, you and I, we are not our mistakes. We are not our accounts. We are not all of our sins and our mistakes and our shame. We are not our pains. We are not the wounds that we've inflicted on others. We are not the wounds that have been inflicted upon us. In Christ, we are a new creation and we have been set free by the blood of Jesus who took every account on his shoulders and invites you to be set free. And then invites you to be a part of a collection of people who leans on to one another in vulnerability and availability and accountability so that we can grow more like Jesus. I just want to boldly, kindly ask you, have you received Jesus? Have you received Jesus? We can read, I, I love that Vivek Murthy is writing 85 pages on this. It's important to read. There are practical steps to take. But if I have not been made right, if I have not received this grace that washes over me, I'm going to live out of my guilt. I'm going to live like I am the mistake. And only by Jesus can I be given a new name, a new identity, and a new story. If you want to receive Jesus for the first time, just put your hands out in front of you and pray this prayer with me. It's not a prayer that you pray just once. This is a reality that you receive. Jesus. I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus, I receive the name that you have given me, free, loved, cherished, much loved son or daughter of God, a new creation. We receive you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your goodness. I thank you, God, that you are good that you are just, that you are loving, that you are strong, that you are mighty, that you are always and forever, you are eternal, you are Father, you are present, you are our friend, you are Lord and Savior and Rescuer and Redeemer. And you invite us to live your way, to live the way of Jesus. So God, would you give us courage this week to work accountability into our relationship with you and into our relationship with one another. And in this moment, God, would you help us not to rush out of this moment, but to sit with you, to listen to your voice, and to be overwhelmed by your amazing grace. There is nothing I could do to deserve your grace. It is undeserved, and yet you give it to us, God. You forgive us, you love us, and you settled our accounts at the cross. How wonderful, how amazing that grace that we can know together. We love you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Let's stand.